Lord be with you. Come, now is the time to worship. Good morning. My name is Denise Gates, and I am one of the lay leaders here at Fredericksburg United Methodist Church. I want to welcome you to worship at Fredericksburg United Methodist Church this morning. Take a look at the side of your screen, and you will see a link to the church's web page in the chat. We invite you to click on that link and see the many ways the church is in ministry this season. You are welcome to fill out the church's online connection card to let us know you're here and to share your prayers with the pastors and congregational care team. You can also subscribe to FUMC's email list and receive a Sunday Scoop email that has links to all of this information as well. If you are watching and participating in today's service as the gathered community at 1115, we will, include in Holy, we will include sharing in Holy Communion. If you are watching and participating at a later time, we invite you to bear witness to this sacrament with silent prayers during that portion of the service. To prepare for this, you will want to gather the following items, bread or crackers and grape juice. If you do not have grape juice, use your best judgment on a replacement for example, juice or water. We welcome you to gather these elements during the remainder of these announcements and during the prelude music. Please check your Friday News Blast or your Sunday Scoop emails for more information about online communion. The youth group has kicked off its fall ministries. There are lots of ways to connect with each other and with Christ this season. And sixth graders, remember that you get to join the youth group too. We encourage you to reach out to David Carrier, FUMC's youth director, at youth at FUMCVA.org for more information about the youth ministry opportunities. Fredericksburg United Methodist Church continues to worship in person. The services take place in Cobbler Hall at 930 and on the Methodist Green at 5 p.m., followed by a physically distanced fellowship time in the church parking lot. The services will be limited to 50 people. Sign-ups for the service are open and will close at the end of the week. You will find more information about registering for these services under Come Worship, located on our website. We will continue to stream our 11.15 a.m. worship service at our Facebook and YouTube pages. Please visit the church's website or look through the church's, web, church's Facebook page to learn more about the many ways to seek, serve, grow, and connect with FUMC. And now let us prepare our uh, hearts and minds for worship. Thank you.
Please join with me to open our time of worship prayer. The responses will be on the screen. God of light and love, we come this morning with eyes stinging from the brightness of your glory. We have become so accustomed to the darkness that your radiant light sometimes overwhelms us. Open our eyes to the light of your ever dawning grace, that our souls may be flooded with love and mercy and joy. Open our hearts to receive your message of comfort and peace and security, that we may find rest in your loving, protective presence. Open our spirits to follow the path you put before us, that we may lead lives committed not just seeing people, but offering the love of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our opening hymn will be Fairest Lord Jesus, number 189, in the United Methodist Hymnal, and the words will be present on the screen. everybody and happy Sunday. I am Jillian Murray and I am the children's ministry director here at Fredericksburg United Methodist Church and I will be giving you your children's message right now. We're going to hear a really awesome story today, one that's very familiar. Um, but before we get into that, I want to ask you to think about the word ordinary and what that might mean to you. So the word ordinary uh, maybe makes you think of something kind of plain maybe something a little bit simple, and maybe not so amazing. So I'm sure in the last six months we've had a lot of very, very ordinary days, right? Hopefully you've been able to find some really special moments in there as well. But um, today's story, we're going to find out about how being ordinary was just so, so great. 
So sometimes when we hear the stories about Jesus, it's easy to think that he was able to do all these amazing things like perform miracles and heal people because he was the Son of God and he was so amazing. It might also be easy to think that we can't do those things because we're just too ordinary and too simple and we're not the Son of God or the daughters of God. But in today's story, we're reminded that not only did Jesus think that ordinary people could do amazing things, he taught them how to do amazing things. So Jesus today in our story goes to a simple, ordinary town, and he meets ordinary people. They're fishermen. Once he gets to this town, he asks these people to be his disciples and to follow him. He tells these ordinary people who are from these ordinary places, I am going to teach you to do what I do so that you can do it too. And he tells them in this famous line, I am going to make you fishers of people, which means he is going to teach them how to spread the good news about God all over. So it took these ordinary people, the disciples, a little bit of time to learn what Jesus was teaching them, but they did end up learning, and they started telling everybody about God's way. And then they went and did the same things that Jesus had done. So if Jesus' disciples, who were these ordinary people from ordinary towns, can follow and do what Jesus did, imagine what we can do too. So being ordinary might sound kind of silly, it might seem a little bit plain, but we are God's children and we can do amazing things for him. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Jillian. As we continue to worship now with our prayers, there are many members of our community that we want to be mindful of. Uh, today, we get to celebrate the joy of Maggie Sheffield, uh, who was married yesterday afternoon, right here out on the Methodist Green. We also want to be mindful of Colleen Nur and her family on the death of her father, Margaret Mock on the death of her brother. And Carol and Janine Cutie on the death of her uncle, and the family, patients, and friends of Dr. Patricia Murray Zarzow on her passing. For those that we've named aloud and the many more that we lift up silently to God on our hearts, let us join together now in prayer. Most amazing God, you call us out of our ordinary lives to be your disciples. We thank you for just drawing ever nearer to us in the midst of our just regular days, maybe like today. We know that there are those in our community who are experiencing great joy today for the opportunity to celebrate uh, with friends and family, for those that have been able to gather online for our Virginia Annual Conference that met yesterday morning, for those that get to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries. God, for all of this, we just give you so much thanks. And we know that there are, again, those who are in the midst of grief over the loss of loved ones, those who are experiencing health concerns, God, those like Neil Dishman and Ann Milby, for those who are hurting, for those who are grieving, we ask that your healing presence may draw near to them, that we may all know that we are not alone during these strange times, or maybe today, again, it's just one of those ordinary days, whether it's a high or a low or a regular Sunday for us, help us know that you are with us and that we are not alone. We ask that you give wisdom to the many physicians and first responders, for those who are responsible for caring for others, may they know how to provide that care. We pray for all of those who are victims of severe weather, whether those be fires or hurricanes or so much else going on in this world. May they find safety and moments of just peace and rest as their lives have been turned upside down. We pray for those that are still navigating this new school year and hope that tomorrow may be uh, a day with fewer uh, questions on does this link work 
or why am I not able to click on the things I should be clicking? We ask just for your patience and grace for students and families and teachers and administrators and all of those that are just trying to do their best navigating this new year. We pray, God, for guidance and for wisdom for those that are leading your church, for those leading this community here in Fredericksburg, this nation, and this world, knowing that there are so many in their charge. For all of those that we lifted aloud and the many more that we lift up to you silently on our hearts, we ask that you just hear our prayer. All of this we pray in the power of your Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we continue to worship with our tithes and offerings, there are several ways you can share your gifts. A link to the church's Give page will be shared in the chat on the side of your screen. You can click on this link to share your tithes and offerings through PayPal, text to give and the Simple Church app. You are welcome to mail your tithes and offerings or even bring them by the church office Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. till 3 p.m. We continue to have the opportunity for a passionate response to assist those that have been affected by the hurricanes and wildfires. The United Methodist Committee on Relief, or UMCOR, sends aid to communities that have been hit by natural disasters. 100% of your donation goes to those in need. There are no administrative fees or staff costs. If you would like to give to these efforts, you may mark an offering with UMCOR Domestic. Today, we continue to see how our worship is continuing vibrantly here at FUMC and making a difference to all who join in worship, even though we are socially distanced. We are seeing God's people and responding with his grace. Today, we want to highlight the ministry of our worship team. Let's take a look at this awesome work of God. So here at the church, I've been helping out with the audiovisual team for uh, quite a few years now. Uh, during COVID, things have obviously changed quite a bit, um, but I, I've really have enjoyed the fact that I've had a chance to, uh, to stretch some creative muscles and do some things that I haven't done before and uh, do my little part to try to help the, the church put the, uh, the best videos out we can each week. Uh, let's see, uh, I have only been here for a few years, of course, but I know this has to be the most unique time or one of in the church's history. Uh, and then look back to where we were when everything changed. Uh, we were preparing Messiah, Easter portion, or Katata coming up actually just a couple weeks away. Uh, and we would go from that to actually learning about sound equipment and live streams and I'm all of a sudden producer and director and, and skills that I know I never developed and to be honest, I don't know how great they are now. But it's been a way to keep the, keep the work going and keep moving forward with the ministry and it's been amazing, it really has. Um, sometimes I catch myself and I'll just be watching and we'll go through a service and it feels like I'm the audience of one that's here for the service and I actually can really just relax and let go and actually enjoy 
the, the actual ministry that goes on in this church, and it's been it's an amazing thing. So here we are now. The, the church has been super supportive. Uh, actually, adding a, an, an additional camera here in the sanctuary, a whole camera system, and uh, sound upgrade in Cobra Hall, just to keep uh, getting the word out and get the ministry out to those that are at home online. Uh, and we looked about, I guess, what we're going to do in the future. Uh, couple examples. I guess we're preparing things virtually, of course, so there will be uh, thoughts and plans there, or you probably already know, so Cole Scholars have uh, started to come back, and we'll involve them more in the service. Uh, we would like to, actually, we'll, we plan to uh, highlight uh, All Saints, of course, and uh, Veterans Day, and those are important days in the life of the church, and uh, of course Christmas, and we will not uh, spare an inch of effort to make everything beautiful for that time. So thank you everyone for your support. Those that want to still join us, we have more than a uh, few jobs that we can uh, loan to you. So uh, thank you a lot. Will you pray with me? Generous Father, we often become too comfortable in how we respond to the needs of others in being the church. Broaden our view of where you desire us to look for new opportunities to reach out in service and worship. Bless the worship teams as they create unique ways of calling us together. Bless these gifts offered by the family of FUMC. May they touch lives in powerful ways to broaden your kingdom. And we ask all this in your amazing son's name. Amen. Today we continue our Come and See worship series that asks us to consider looking at ourselves and how we are following the way of Jesus. And it also invites us, as we heard last week, to invite others to come and see Jesus as well. This week we move a little bit forward in the gospel story from where we were last week with Jesus' introduction to some of the disciples for the first time in John's gospel, with John pointing to Jesus as the Lamb of God. This week we move to see Jesus move to actually call them to follow him. This will be a familiar passage, I think. The gospel message this week comes from the gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. I'll begin reading at verse 12. Let us hear this word together. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road, by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region of the shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with her father, Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics, and he cured them. 
And great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and far beyond the Jordan. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God, who comes to us by the lake shores of our own life, and calls us through the power of Jesus Christ to follow. Lord, we come to you this morning, Lord, just seeking your voice once more. Settle our hearts and minds as we reflect upon this scripture of old, that we might not only hear the call, but we might heed and live into the call as well. We pray this prayer in the powerful name of our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. At this point in our series of following Jesus in his story, he's emerged from the waters of baptism, been tempted by the devil. Last week we heard Jesus being introduced by his cousin John the Baptist and beginning to interact with some of the early followers that became his disciples like Andrew and Peter. This week, as we pick up here in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4, we see a movement in Jesus. He moves from the invitation we heard last week, that simple way to introduce people to the way of God, come and see, to the call of follow me. Did you hear it in the Gospel reading? This marks an increase in intensity for the work of Jesus and ultimately his calling to others and to us. That intensity is right there in the beginning of this text. Did you hear and notice that as the text opened for today, John the Baptist, who baptized Jesus, who was calling him Lamb of God last week, he's in prison now. It says that John has been arrested. We hear from the Gospel of Matthew later over in chapter 14 of John's death in prison, his murder in prison. By the mention of this in the gospel story, now it's a critical marker. It marks the urgency of what Jesus is about and what he's come to do. This call that he begins to share with others to fish for people. Matthew Matthew sets out Jesus' calling and then the unfolding of his ministry in this context of threat The one who baptized him, the Lord, the one who the Lord sent ahead of him is in prison and will die before long. John's arrested. And in Jesus' ministry, right from the beginning, looming evil bites at the edges of Jesus' earthly ministry, really from this point on. I'd like us to notice as we look at the call of Christ, as we look at this call to come and see and to share the good news, that Jesus was doing the stuff that Jesus did, the stuff that changed human history in the midst of challenges and a lot of bad stuff happening. Jesus did what Jesus did in the midst of challenges. The one who baptized him, the one who proclaimed him as the Lamb of God, as we saw his ministry unfolding last week, has been arrested. Now, I don't need to note the challenges in our own today's world, in the world today, in our own being faithful to Jesus Christ in this fabulous year that we are a part of in 2020. You know the challenges. You know right where the pain exists. However, it's important for us to remember that Jesus came at a time when there were many threats and great oppression, where evil lurked around every corner, waiting to really devour this approaching kingdom of God that Jesus begins to preach. All while Jesus himself was offering invitation to advancing healing and grace from God's very hands. In today's gospel, we see Jesus walking on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he calls these fishermen, two of which we met last week as we looked at the scripture, Andrew and Peter, and then added to that James and John, right from their boats and their nets and their families. We heard of their initial introductions last week in John's gospel, but here they're at their vocation. They've got lines in the water or they're mending their nets. And Jesus, 
pulls them away from their bread and butter and from, in the case of James and John, their family, their father. He calls them, follow me and I will have you fish for people. I mentioned a few weeks ago that since my dad's death in May, I've thought a lot about the time I used to spend with him in my younger years fishing on the boat. This was one hobby that my dad and I shared together a lot of time, just the two of us, out upon open water for hours, from dawn to the midday heat, or the break of evening through a good portion of the night fishing. What I remember about those years of fishing together was that my dad was a super patient teacher. Now, he wasn't always known for patience. Those of you that might have known my dad, he was not a patient man in a lot of things. But in teaching, he was. He was a skilled instructor, instructor, never seeming to get upset with my fishing, even when I messed up, hanging the bait and the line up in a tree limb, again, casting in the wrong way, overcasting. Or even in hooking him one time in the shoulder when I got so excited that we had multiple bites on multiple rods in the boat, I hooked him right in the shoulder. Dad was patient. Dad knew this work, that fishing took time and patience and the development of skill in my young self. And I remember, I can remember so much from his teaching In my mind's eye, I can specifically remember, and it's been a long time since I've been fishing, maybe I need to go, but I can specifically remember a hook's knot. I can remember how my dad showed me, you know, you you do seven twists and you loop back through the loop and you pull it tight and put the hook on. And when you do that, even the largest fish will not slip the, the hook knot. These things that I can just see and know and speak to and wrote, even not having done it for years is because of my dad teaching me the skill of fishing. Now, Jesus, in today's text, he calls these lead disciples, these ones that become leaders in the disciple movement in the early church, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, and he shows them the work of fishing. Now, they know fishing, but he shows them the work of fishing for people. Sometimes when we visit this call story of theirs, this come and follow me and I will make you fish for men, I will make you fish for people text, we rightly focus on the call and response, on Jesus' call to follow and their immediate dropping their nets and their lines and leaving their father in the boat and following Jesus. But today I'd like for us to lift up and to notice That, but to also notice what happens next. Did you hear it? When you read on past that part that we've heard a lot of sermons on, the part of where they left their their nets and their boats, in verse 23 it says this. It says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. Jesus took, you see, these new, green, inspired by the Holy Spirit, by this Lamb of God disciples, and he took them right into the darkness of the world. John had been arrested. There was threat about. There had been centuries of foreign oppression and conquest. But in their time of answering this call to follow, Jesus took them out immediately to teach him to fish. He took them to the mission field, this land that the prophet Isaiah centuries early early in his ministry said that light would dawn in this particular land in the midst of the darkness of the people's lives, in this land of Zebulon and Naphtali on the road by the sea in Galilee of the Gentiles. Jesus takes them there, a place where scripture says that people had long been sitting in the darkness and the shadows of death, and Jesus shows them how to offer light, how to speak good news in the midst of dark places, how to heal the hurts of those in pain. Jesus, the master fisherman, shows Peter, James, John, and Andrew the work to which now they are called. 
fishers of people to, to, to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, to cure illness and pains of those that are near and around them. Jesus is doing this work, but Jesus is also showing us, showing all of us how to follow. To follow Jesus is to walk into dark places, to walk near to where there needs to be some light in the pond, if you will. To fish, to fish. And you might ask, <laughs> to fish, what does that mean? What does that mean in this text? Jesus says they're going to be fishers of people. How can I fish? Yeah, Gina, I get your dad taught you how to fish on a boat, but what does that mean in this year 2020? And Jesus shows us, he shows us it's to offer hope, to offer good news, to be a part of healing where people are wounded and hurting. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, We see social relationships controlled everywhere by the principles which Jesus illustrated in life. When we see this, when we see trust, love, mercy, altruism, then we shall know that the kingdom of God is here, he said. Jesus came preaching, did you hear it? The nearness of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Matthew's gospel says this in verse 17, that he proclaimed that the kingdom of God had come near and he called people to turn toward it, to repent and to turn to God. This kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, came near to us nearly 2,000 years ago in Christ, preaching this good news, healing the sick. But the reality is that kingdom is not fully visible in the here and now. That kingdom that we pray about, God's kingdom on earth coming as it is in heaven, that we pray about every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. That kingdom comes by the power of God's spirit when we enact it. When we go fishing, if you will, when we follow. When we become fishers of people carrying true light into dark places. Can you hear that call today? Can you hear it? Land of Fredericksburg and beyond. State of Virginia, USA, in the darkness of year 2020 that we are so ready to name up on you, up on you in the shadow of death and darkness, up on you a light has dawned in the wilderness of this time. The light dawned 2,000 years ago in the life and ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that light is needed. It's needed when people are crying for justice and freedom from long-held oppression, just like they were in the day of Jesus. The long hope for cures, just like we hope for now with this wretched disease, COVID. Jesus takes these novice fishers of people, the ones who sense that there's a dawn in the midst of the darkness, and he goes out with them and he begins healing. This was Jesus' first act with his first disciples, sharing good news, bearing hope, and teaching these men to fish anew, to fish in new waters of hope and grace and mercy. One of my favorite spiritual discipline authors is Dallas Willard, and Dallas writes these wise words. Churches are not the kingdom of God, but are primary and inevitable expressions, outposts, instrumentalities of the presence of the kingdom among us. They are societies of Jesus. That's so good and wise. Let me say it again. Churches are not the kingdom of God, but we are primary and inevitable, inevitable expressions, outposts, instrumentalities of the presence of the kingdom among us, for they are societies of Jesus. Churches are to be societies of Jesus. We, the people of God, followers of Jesus, disciples in the present age we are to express this kingdom 
exist in community, illustrated by the way of Jesus Christ, who takes this invitation to come and see the Lord and then moves those disciples out into the mission field societies of Jesus in this world, primary expressions in the here and now of the reign of God among us, right in the darkness, a light dawning. That's the work of discipleship in this present moment, in this age, for such a time as this. Like Reverend Dr. King said, when we allow Jesus to be our way, the way modeled and taught in the early disciples, then the kingdom becomes visible tangible and darkness moves away it's cast away to the edges right where evil belongs because it was defeated upon the cross of Jesus Christ the cries of healing and justice wane in the midst of the goodness of the kingdom of God because healing and justice are part of that kingdom rolling down like that same prophet Isaiah says like mighty roaring waters Now, these are not new insights. These are not new insights that I'm preaching for this present moment. As you see, they're modeled right here in the gospel by Jesus. And they were present in the call of the early church with those disciples. And even in the formation of the Methodist movement with John Wesley. John Wesley, the founder of our denomination, he said this. He said, give me 100 who love only God with all their heart and hate sin with all their heart, and we shall shake the gates of hell and bring the kingdom of God in one generation. That's what Wesley preached and said. Now, he said that in the 1700s. The state of the church in this year, 2020, it's uncertain. This week, I heard a report talking about potential voters in the coming election and there are projections that even fewer voters in this election season will identify as Christian when compared with the last election just four years ago. The data suggested a flight from Christianity happening even in the past four years. We've lost people, not gained people to the faith. That's not a political statement. It's a statement that does require us, however, to follow Jesus very closely, whether we affiliate red or blue or some purple or other color. Jesus asks us to follow. And in doing so, he shows us that our following will prompt us to share hope and good news. And to be about the work of healing, healing the pains, the illness around us in community. When we call others to come and see, we deploy them for this very mission of Christ. The present reality of our world and community is that there is a need. There is a need for light to be dawning just like there was a need for light to be dawning on the Sea of Galilee and the shores of that ancient land. There's a need for patient teaching, patient teaching of the way of Jesus fishing and spreading good news, of being bold in this ministry, whether it is in large or small acts that help heal and aid the greatest pains around us, a witness to hope in the darkness from the fallout that is very real from COVID-19 and grief and loss, despair and problems with finances to the desperation of the natural disasters that continue to explode in our great nation and outward into the world. With the food insecurity that is right present in our community that we try to address on a daily basis through our church and also in the homelessness around us that we are part of the healing ministry of Micah to to try to keep that at bay and to help. And also with the deep wounds of systemic racism in our community and outward into our nation. In all of this, we are called. We are called to walk right into the darkness, just like Jesus, and to share the way to share the way of Jesus in the world. Jesus saw pain and he offered good news and healing. It's pretty simple. He went to where the people were hurting and in his goodness, 
If you read on through the last of that chapter, in his goodness, others were drawn to him. They were drawn to him. We have to think about who we are in the context of our culture and also in the context of the world. When I was in seminary, I went on mission and an education experience in the Baltic region over in Europe to the former Soviet bloc country of Estonia on the Baltic Sea. And I learned wonderfully about the deep roots of Methodism in that place. I met so many courageous Christians in that journey. And as part of that, I met a young English translator who had a deep faith. But she was very weary of Americans. To her, living in that time when her country was struggling in transition to be a free and democratic society, to be a capitalism driven economy. We, the Americans, seem so self-focused and so self-indulgent. She explained to me what seemed to be a waste to her in the use of water and electricity to create ice for our cold drinks that we would toss away in a cup with no thought of the waste or the cost for that ice. She made me think. She taught us in that area how to ride the public transportation and in riding the bus. Uh, My husband and I, she asked as a family of two, she said, "Uh, how many cars do you have over in America? And our answer was two at the time. And she (laughs) responded to us with a somewhat stern demeanor. She said, two people, two cars. Why do you need two cars for two people when most people in my country don't have one and don't have need for one? We make it around without that expense. You are so extravagant and wasteful, she said, when so many have so little. I'm sure many of us could tell similar stories of being in other places or even being in our own community where living wages are something different from our own And people witness to the struggle, struggles that we can't imagine in comparison. And in the face of that, whether we work with our Micah friends here in our community or we are in that far off mission country, we have so much. We have so much to share, so much in comparison. This young woman really made me look at my ice maker and my ice in the cup really differently, as well as my car. When we're confronted sometimes with what may seem like just basic things to our existence, but they're extravagance, we're called to look at and we're challenged to look at the darkness of the losses and the pain around us in a different way. I think in this time we're confronted to look at the losses that have come with covid And also with the pain, the pain, the long-held pain that many have suffered from white privilege and the reality of just walking around in a darker skin in our community. The way of Jesus Christ calls us right in our realities into the pain of others with the heart of Christ. That's what makes a difference, is to take the heart of Jesus in the midst of that and offer witness and good news and healing with what we have and what we know. And sometimes, sometimes this may require us to sacrifice some of our extravagance and to think about our self-indulgences and to move away ourselves from places of darkness and enter into the true light. Peter James and John, these early disciples, they do set the stage. You've heard the story before. They left everything they knew. I met someone recently and ended up in some counsel with them and hopefully was part of offering a little bit of light into their story. This person had known great pain and unimaginable losses, one right after another, pain upon pain. His story which I believe to be true, although it was very hard to believe because it was just so sad. His story was added to in pain because he felt that no one cared about the pain that he'd experienced. When he first had some losses, he said people from his church, they were there, they brought food and they checked on him and there was calls and there were hugs. But when the pain continued, 
when there was another tragedy and something else went wrong and the losses got harder and the time grew more, people pulled back. Oh, they were letting him rest. They were letting him deal through this thing. And to him, that brought so much darkness. It was easier, I think, for the people around him just to pull back because they didn't know what to do about his struggle. But in the midst of this, he felt abandoned, abandoned by the light and hope of Christ, even the church. It became for him the darkest of times. And, and now he's on a long journey of processing that and trying to heal. Sometimes when things are hard, I mean really hard, where people are suffering, where people are without a job or they're facing grief upon grief, when their finances just never seem to meet the ends that they need, when they're sick again and again for a very long time, when they're wounded by deep pains like racism over the course of their whole lives, sometimes we don't naturally walk in that direction. That's right where I'm going. Somebody's hurting really bad. That's not our human nature, but what we see in the nature of Christ is that Jesus walks right into that. He walks into that, and he says to those following him, the disciples, he says to us, come and follow me, and I'll show you how to really fish. Fish in the darkness. Much like my dad did on the boat with younger me. Patient and guiding and wise. Jesus, like the disciples of old, he walks with us into those corridors, darkened by sin, by the hurts of the world, and he turns on the light for us. That's the good thing. And we just need to follow into that light. So as we leave today, this question is before us. Where do you need to carry his light? Right now. And to whom? Pray with me. Let us pray. God of light and hope and life eternal. Lord, first we are so thankful for the way of Jesus Christ. The way that did change all of human history forevermore. And changes the hope for eternity for all of us. Lord, as we reflect on the power of this call to truly follow and to become fishers of people, it gets a little bit more complex when we think about what that really means for each of us in our own lives, with our own blessings and challenges, with our own measure of faith and the gifts of your Spirit. Lord, we pray that you would just open our eyes to see the the corridors where your light is already breaking forth and help us to walk in that direction, even if it's a bit dark and hard. For you will never leave us or forsake us. Remind us of the power that unleashed this early church and the disciples, that same power that calls us in the midst of the darkness of this world in this time. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your presence, for this call, for the opportunity and hope that you don't only just see in us, each of us, but you see in the world around us for such a time as this. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. For the beauty
Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are so excited today to gather at communion table here in this beautiful space of our sanctuary for the very first time, Pastor Josh, since the month of March when we gathered here for our last time to be together in person in this space. We're gathering in this online fashion around the communi communion table through special provisions offered to us through the office of our bishop and the leadership of the Virginia Conference. And this communion is specifically designed for those that are joining us at the 1115 premier live stream. So if you are with us, we invite you to go ahead and get those items together that you have um, been instructed that you can use for communion in your own home. Uh, we mentioned that at the beginning of the service. It's also in your Sunday scoop. There's also a video from the pastors that you may have seen. Gather those items now and let us begin to pray and move to this time of celebrating Holy Communion. Let us pray. Gracious and amazing God, we come to you now, Lord, across the distance, really of time and space, to enter into the mystery of your amazing grace made known in Jesus Christ. Lord, we have heard the call this day to to come and to follow, to leave our, our humanness behind in many ways and pick up the very mantle and godliness of Christ. We come to this table, Lord, in the realization that sometimes we are so far from that way of Jesus, and yet we are greeted, greeted with your grace. We ask, Lord, that you would pour upon us with the power of your spirit now, and just cleanse us and ready us for this moment as we ready the table before us in our homes and in the places right where we're worshiping in this hour. Ready our hearts as well. Forgive us of our sins. Clean and purify our hearts and our lives that we might be presented to you, Lord, always holy and acceptable. We pray this prayer, Lord, as we come to this time of remembering the story of old together. And we pray this prayer in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Friends, on the night in which Christ gave himself up for us, he was having a meal with his disciples. And at this meal, Christ took bread. He gave thanks to God broke that bread, shared it with his disciples, and said, Take and eat, for this is my body, and it's broken and given for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And after the supper was finished, Christ took the cup that was there with them. Again, he gave thanks to God, his heavenly Father, shared that cup with those same disciples, and said, Take and drink. For this is my blood of the new covenant, and it is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us pray. Holy God, as we remember your gifts to us in Jesus Christ, we ask, Lord, that you would pour out upon us the gift of your spirit, pour up on us, pour up on the gifts of mere water and juice or bread or cracker, whatever is before us now. Lord, by the power of your spirit, pour up on these gifts that we have presented unto you this day. Make them be for us, Lord, the true body and blood of Jesus Christ that we would be for the world, the body of Christ, faithful disciples, fishers of people. Until that day, Lord, when we feast with you, when the distance is crossed and we are together arm in arm singing your praises around that table of grace that is yours. Until that day, Lord, sustain us and guide us and pour over us in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen. Amen. Friends, as there is one loaf, there is one body. 
the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, the cup of salvation, the blood of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Friends, I invite us to join together in praying that prayer that Jesus taught us while he was with us on earth by praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is with the joy that we get to name that the table is set and that the Lord's Supper is prepared. And that all who are worshiping with us at this hour, who would like to receive, are welcome to do so. Because there are no strangers to Christ, and all are welcome to the feast. If you have your bread or your crackers with you, we invite you to break off a piece and to share that with those you are worshiping with. And let them know that the body of Christ is broken for you. And after you all have your bread or your crackers, we invite you to dip that into your juice and know that the blood of Christ is shed for you. At the end of the service, if you have extra elements, we invite you to to eat those and to drink those. Or if you would prefer, you're welcome to return those to the earth. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us pray and give thanks for these gifts. God, who offered himself for us, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, we thank you, Lord, for the mystery of your grace that extends in the stream, that extends right to our hearts this day. We thank you for loving us enough to give yourself for us. And help us now, Lord, as we ready ourselves to go out into the world to take this gift to be nourished and nurtured by it once more right in our homes and to share it right there in our homes and outward into the world until we come to table again. We pray this prayer, Lord, and we give you thanks. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Friends, we invite you to join together now in our closing hymn. This is a sweet hymn of the church. I want to walk as a child of the light. The words for this song will appear on your screen before you, or you can find it as number 206 in your United Methodist hymnal. Let us sing.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, go from this place today inspired that Jesus never leaves us or forsakes us. Yes, he calls us. He calls us into uncharted places and things that may be very different from our vocation, just like the early disciples. But he goes with us and he turns the light on and he blesses us in the journey. So we go forth to follow today. And we go forth, not alone, we go in the power of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us go forth in peace and in his mighty grace. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.